somewhere we'll see. Absolutely. Well, I wanted to, uh, I, I'm recording. This is Dr. Michael Leibowitz. Uh, my, I will say, Michael, that you've been my most influential teacher. And I've uh, been out to be, visit you a couple of times for one-on-one -on -one classes as well as group classes. And um, now what I do in my office is mostly nutrition consulting for people who have chronic problems, probably much as you do. And I, I, I owe a lot to you. So I just, I wanted to... Uh, just chat with you and ask you some questions and thank you for taking your time to speak with me today. Sure, thanks for having me. Sure, um, I, I, I wanted to just maybe just start pestering you with some questions and I wanted to ask you, what got you started in down the, down the natural medicine road or even as a healthcare provider at all? What, what, were your, what was your starting story? Wow, I mean, it, it, it probably starts back in college. Mm -hmm. And back in college, I can't tell you why, but I started reading hundreds and hundreds of health books that were available. This would have been in the 1960s. Yeah. And, um, you know, some of them were fairly radical. Um, a lot of them were out of print that you could get from certain companies. And um, it just kind of grew from there. And, and back in, um, I think, 19... 76 or so, I, I took a touch for health class, mm -hmm. which kind of wowed me with um, the ability to figure out different things with muscle testing. And um, as a result, I ended up going to chiropractic school as, as a vehicle to um, get a license so I could practice what I was learning. Yeah. It just kind of grew from there. Oh, well, awesome. I, I, when I went to chiropractic school, it was kind of like an excuse as a way to get a, a license to be able to help people, but I had never really used chiropractors before school myself. I wanted to get into that field and kind of help rehab people or help them recover from stuff. And then in school, I got exposed to applied kinesiology and thought, this is way more fun. I've got to do this. So, uh, and then I heard whispers of this teacher called Michael Leibowitz, and I had to go take a class from him. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I wanted to ask you um, just some other general questions. Uh, what What is like, I know there's not an average patient, do you, but do you see some trends of people that seek you out for certain conditions? Is, do you see a common type of symptoms for your patients? We see a lot of people with different gastrointestinal issues, mm -hmm. be it constipation, diarrhea, pain, you know, bloating, whatever it happens to be. A lot of um, chronic fatigue, yeah. um, people who um, have self-diagnosed themselves with either fungal or candida issues or Lyme disease or, you know, any of those type of things. Um, th that's probably the majority of people. How do people find you, Michael? Is it just simply through word of mouth or do you have some, uh, how, do they, how do they find you at all? To be honest, I don't know. Um, <laughs> In, in 40 years of practice, I think for maybe two years, I've owned, I've had a business card. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever been listed in the phone book back in the days when people used phone books. Um, yeah. I guess it would be word of mouth. Um, you know, we were practicing in rural West Virginia. Yeah. And, you know, people started finding us from all over the country, basically, and it still happens. So um, that's awesome. I'm, I'm, if, you help, I'm, if you help people. Yeah. They tell other people. Yeah, I think that you have, um, I think you're pretty famous for getting results faster than the usual. Let's do 12 visits and see how it goes. It seems to be very deep or at least noticeable, very serious gains after one visit. And uh, that's what I would want as a patient searching for a doctor. I don't want to sign up for a bunch of repetitive care. I want to find out what I need. Let's make some serious gains because I may not live in the area or I may live across town or what have you. And I want to take home some stuff and make some progress. Right. I agree. I mean, there are definitely some very challenging people that respond slower, Yeah. but I'm kind of obsessed with getting people better and a good doctor is a good detective. Yeah. They really take a good case history. 
to see, you know, what might have been some of the causative factors. They have to be very comprehensive in their exam. Yeah. You know, the, the shorter the appointment when you're just trying to kind of run people through in a sense, the, the more chance you're going to miss something really critical. So yeah. you, you tend to try to cover all bases. Yeah. I've, 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 I've learned to have my antennas go up when, when a patient says, oh, this probably is not important, but I wanted to mention this one little thing, and it's, it's like a real aha clue very often. Mm -hmm. exactly. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I really, you know, I just wanted to mention, too, when I got out of chiropractic school into the world of testing people, I, I had no experience and now 20 year, some years later, I'm like so different. Did you, have you, where have you gone since when you graduated from school to now? What, what's been some learning things for you? I think I learned the most from my patients. And, and you also learn the most from your failures. Mm -hmm. Because you know, you're working on people and they're not responding as you would hope you know, the question is, you know, where do you go from there? You know, and you have to think, did I miss something? Is there something in my tested procedure that needs tweaking in some way? Is the patient just not compliant? You know, whatever it happens to be, you know, are there new things that they're finding in natural medicine that affect people? You know, like, for instance, when um, electromagnetic radiation became very well known as another stressor, you know, how do we test for that? You know, is that important? Or is it going to bring change to people? Or now people look at things like biofilms and mycotoxins and other things that affect people that we really didn't know about 40 years ago. And again, trying to incorporate as many things as we can into what we look for has been very helpful. You're always tweaking your testing procedure, I think, to, um, I think to help uh, us as doctors uh, have less false negatives. Is that kind of one of the big things for you? Yes, so, so let's say um, someone, you know, it becomes well known that there's a new stressor out there, like say 5G. Mm -hmm. You know, my question number one is, let's test it and see. If it doesn't test like it's a stressor, maybe it's not, maybe there's just a lot of hype out there that someone's, you know, taking advantage of, or maybe it is a real issue but we just haven't figured out a good way to test for it yet. And we have, as you say, false negatives. That's when something is a problem, but you just don't find it. So yeah. you know, we have to find ways to provoke the body in a sense to show whether or not it's um, being affected by it or not. Yeah, I think that's one of my, my weaknesses is when something's slow to respond, I think I, I missed something. So I'm, I'm always wondering what I miss. But Michael, where do you... I look to you as like a source for learning new things. Like uh, you'll say, oh, for example, 5G or something. But where do you get your information for like, hey, there's this new thing I should be paying attention to? Like, That's a really tough question. I mean, it used to be you know, a couple of decades ago that there were a couple of really good researchers that would put out um, monthly research tapes or papers and they would tell you kind of what's new in the world of natural medicine mm -hmm. and you could look at that and then you could adapt it to your testing procedures and so forth. Now um, it's hard. I recently took an 18 hour course from for instance the it was called the Environmental Health Symposium. Yeah. We we're talking about the effect of mainly things that we already checked for mm -hmm. um, probes and metals and food toxins and all that on people. And, you know, sometimes you can go through something like that and glean something. You know, I go to a um, International College of Applied Kinesiology meeting every year that 150 doctors get together to yeah. share the research. And we, you know, we, we learn from each other. Yeah. And, and so, you know, again, you keep learning from your patients. And yeah. uh, also, if you're challenged with your own health issues, you can learn a lot by being yeah. your own guinea or your family can and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not perfect. And I appreciate, I may have gotten into this profession to save my life. So um, just kind of helping with my own aches and pains is a, is a usual ongoing project. Um, mm -hmm. I, I also know people who are listening or watching may not know, but I think you've helped some athletes too. What, 
what are what have things that you've seen with some of the athletes that you've seen you don't have to name names but maybe i think you've mentioned some 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 improvement in uh sports parameters we've worked with some major league baseball players some national hockey league and some nfl mm -hmm. a boxer or two but um you, you could do a number of things. I mean, on the one hand, a lot of times you can speed up injury recovery. Yeah. More than, and, than some of the doctors that they utilize. You can sometimes prevent injury by just making sure there are no imbalances in muscle function. Yeah. There's no, um, certain nutritional imbalances could make you more injury prone. And also we found that if we do um, do all of our what you might call muscle work to make sure that all of the muscles are working in sync and optimally. Um, you can also increase performance. I mean, we've seen batting averages go up significantly and, you know, speed and pitches go up and so forth. That's, that's very cool. I know the athletes appreciate that. I, um, I often have, I, in the Dallas area, I tend to attract a lot of cyclists and I'll have them face down on the table and I'll check their hamstring and it's, fairly common where one leg is functionally weaker than the other and they are like, fix it, fix it. And um, I'm glad to be able to kind of point that out to them. And very frequently the stabilizing factor is some nutritional support or a change of the diet that, you know, ultimately right. stops the need for recurrent physical work. Agreed. Yeah. Um, I had just random question. Do you miss Colorado? Well, I miss Colorado. Um, a little bit. I mean, we live in Maui. It's yeah. uh, a little bit. Not You've got one great place to replace the other place. Right. I, I, I remember with your own health conditions that you were like way high in the mountains in the boonies in Colorado, and then you ended up more in the Grand Junction area. Right. There was a time where I was very chemically sensitive. I was damaged by molds and, and mercury and some other things. It was very hard to be around perfume or be around um, formaldehyde, you know, new furniture, um, different things like that. So we, we moved out in the middle of nowhere, basically, to an environmentally safe house while we helped develop different therapies that would be helpful. And, um, you know, once I got over it basically then we return to a, a more normal lifestyle for us yeah yeah i'm i'm in, i am uh, happy for you that you're in maui and i would love to come visit and do a, a class again and also see the see the island mm -hmm. sure anytime except now since they're quarantining us are they saying uh not not exactly now later correct okay uh, I wanted also just kind of a, uh, just touch on the Supreme Nutrition Company that you started. Can you give a little story about why, why how that started and, and what it's doing now? Um, I used to work somewhat with a company named Thorn Research, mm -hmm. which is very high quality uh, vitamin, minerals, some other supplements. And um, one day, I was on Kauai on vacation and a friend of mine had me work in his tarot field. Yeah. And he, he warned me while I was there that I probably would get leptospirosis because it was in the water that you have to stand in all day when you're working in the tarot field. I ended up not getting leptospirosis. He actually ended up getting it, even though he thought he was immune at that point. Yeah. And I thought that the reason that that happened was I was eating um, some marinda fruit, which is also called noni. And noni, um, at certain stages, can be very antimicrobial. And um, I, when I got back to Colorado, I imported some dried noni fruit from different countries in the world. And we started blind testing it on people. And we saw that um, a couple of them seemed to test very well. And then um, we got a little bit bigger supply. We gave it to some patients who were traveling to areas where typically they got fungal infections. They were going to some warm tropical areas. And the first time in their lives they reported that as long as they had eaten that, they didn't get a fungal infection. 
on their travels. So we came back and um, our research had been going in a, a little bit different direction and they weren't really interested in coming out with the product. Um, and we found some people who were willing to formulate, um, to start their own company, which I just advised for. Uh -huh. they, we would formulate, um, they found a company that would encapsulate the herbs without adding any fillers, binders, excipients, because when you read labels, most companies will add, they'll add magnesium stearate or calcium stearate or steric acid or propylene glycol or cross caramelose sodium. They put all different things into their product. Sometimes they do it, um, basically, some of the products are what, what are basically lubricants. Mm -hmm. So it'll the company to encapsulate at a much faster rate, which is much more lucrative for them. Like a lubricant so, for the machine itself? It's a lubricant so that the powder doesn't stick together and so that it doesn't clump capsule. So it doesn't clump and it slides the capsule easy. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, it took us a long time to find a company that wouldn't do that. The way that they don't do that is they have to go very slowly. Sometimes it can take 10 times as long to encapsulate. So it's definitely not as lucrative, but the, the product ends up being better because a lot of these lubricants um, impede absorption and some of them have a high degree of sensitivity. So a lot of patients don't do as well on them. And so we started with that product and slowly as um, we found the you know, need for different things to help a lot of our patients, because this was basically done for our patients. You know, we would do a lot of research and maybe we would find an herb that we thought helped strengthen the body against electromagnetic radiation, or maybe one that was a really good antimicrobial. Again, we would test on patients, we would find sources that tested well, and we would slowly add, I think there's about 35 products in the line at this point. Yeah, it keeps growing. I get this newsletter from you saying, we just came out with this awesome new thing. And then I have to call up Supreme Nutrition and make sure that they send me a sample so I can start testing it. I appreciate that. Right. That's um, uh, Michael, you mentioned one time in one of your lectures, you said, um, what, what were those numbers that you said that you would, that you would guess for the average guy or gal on the street carrying around chronic infections? And then what's the average number that you see on someone that comes in to see you that's ill? Well, there's a few things you have to realize. We all harbor microbes. I mean, some of them are beneficial. Some of them are opportunistic in the sense that they don't cause a problem unless you have a particular stress in your body. Yeah. And some of them are more pathologic. You know, like, for instance, there's a lot of people who carry Lyme disease. Mm-hmm. But they might be totally asymptomatic and their body is doing a really good job at holding it at bay. Yeah. But then either they get in a car wreck or they're going through a, a re big relationship stress or they end up taking a job that is night shift or, you know, working down, down um, wind of a chemical factory mm -hmm. and it's the scales for them and suddenly their body's weaker and that opportunistic organism can start manifesting and they'll start developing symptoms. So when you look at that, I mean, everybody probably carries something. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the average patient that comes in, and again, we're doing more of a general screening, so it's just kind of an estimate. Yeah. But there might be being affected by half a dozen different organisms. You know, some could be fungal, some could be bacterial, some could be viral, some could be spirochete. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more and again some people can live in harmony with all of it because of their good lifestyle good genetics yeah. lack of stressors, etc do, do you eventually like to i know you've helped me kind of learn to focus on remove the stressors as the first layer of getting better and then ultimately do you like to get patients more long-term stable by by getting them on good food or good vitamins for, for maintenance, or is it mostly remove the stressors and then come back another time if you have another problem? Well, I mean, removing the stressors does change their lifestyle too. 
you know, if you're finding different toxic metals, let's say you're finding aluminum on them, uh -huh. you know, you're teaching them, you know, don't buy stuff in aluminum cans, don't use aluminum cookware, don't use antiperspirants that have aluminum in it. It's, and, you know, hopefully they're going to look at that and do it long term, not just till they feel a little bit better and then reintroduce it. Yes. You know, we put them on a diet that in most cases brings them a little bit more toward a whole food lifestyle because we're taking them off of different stressors. We might have to take them off of refined sweetening or caffeine or who knows what. And yeah. again, we teach them how to read labels. And a lot of them will come back and say, wow, I never knew that 80% of the things I eat have sugar listed on the ingredient list. So they, they learn and they, they yeah. change. Ideally, you want the person for many things to take care of themselves. You don't want them totally to rely on you. You might need to work with them for a while to get them to that point where they're feeling good, but hopefully you're also acting as a teacher, educator, et cetera, so that they have tools that they can function at a much higher level than they did before and keep it up, you know, in a lot of cases. Yeah, keep it up by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, another random thing I just was wanting to ask a question was, do you see very often that a person's health is tied to uh, their spouse who has something going on too that maybe is a carrier or uh, maybe their health is tied to the quality of their home um, air quality or their work air quality or the electromagnetic field, that something in the environment, not just this one person, do you see that much? You see that um, probably the majority of the time. Um, wow. for instance, with, with microbes, um, I forget the study my son quotes when he teaches, but a French kiss can pass something like 300 million bacteria. Wow. So, you know, and, and like you said, there are some people that are asymptomatic carriers. It's the whole story of typhoid Mary. Yeah. Or Mary carried typhoid but didn't have any symptoms or, or even COVID today with all the asymptomatic people that, you know, theoretically can pass it. Yeah. So a lot of times, um, you know, there, there might be a spouse that um, keeps, in a sense, reseeding the, the symptomatic person with certain microbes. Mm -hmm. um, you live in a house um, that has mold in the air. You're going to breathe it in. Mold loves to live in warm, wet, dark environments, which is what the inside of your body is, and suddenly you have a fungal problem. Yeah. Um, you know, you live with um, your router plugged in two feet from your head at night. Um, yeah. It's going to be certain it's going to have an effect. So, again, it's part of the detective work, in taking a case history and so forth to figure out what things are stressing because it basically is a total load phenomenon. You have a threshold of stressors that you can handle. And if you go above that, you become symptomatic. The stressors could be just unhealthy foods. They could be foods you're sensitive to. They could be microbes. They could be chemicals. They could be metals. It could be emotional stress. It could be spiritual stress. And when the combination of all of those, again, goes above your threshold, you become asymptomatic. It's almost like the weak link uh, in your body blows out. Yeah. Our job is to lower your total load by dealing with as many of these things as we can so that um, you'll go back to an asymptomatic state. Gotcha. That's, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't do everything, but I try to lighten the load, like you say, and there's a lot of things that people are unaware that that's causing the load. And right. so I kind of, like you say, use the word detective a lot. And uh, rather than treating the symptom, I'm, I kind of try to educate my patients that the, I don't care about the label of your condition. I want to find out what's the cause behind it. And uh, right. patients seem very excited. They say, I got diagnosed. They know what it is. It's arthritis. I'm like, well, I want to know what's causing the arthritis. I'm not happy that you now have that diagnosis let's try to find what's inflammatory that we can reduce so Correct. it's always kind of a fun a fun uh conversation with the first patient visit i know because it makes it difficult because people will contact me and say i have such and such you know what do i do and they want 
you know, they, they expect that one name diagnosis gives you one set of treatments. Yeah. You know, if you have arthritis, you take fish oil or whatever it happens to be, and everybody's different. There, there might be different causes, you know, like, like you said with arthritis, five people might have arthritis, each one has it for a different reason. Yeah. And you can take an anti-inflammatory, but you still have the thing that's causing the inflammation. So you're not really helping that much. And if you can find out what those stressors are that are the cause for you and deal with those, you're much better off. Yeah. Yeah. But we're, uh, it's an educational thing and it's a shift in thinking. It's uh, not the normal I see this on television. Television is like, you have this disease, here's your pill that's advertised heavily, go get that pill. And uh, I try to, like you say, educate and be a detective for what's behind the condition and it's, it's different per person. It's, it's a little bit trickier now um, because of Google. And like, I, I know that I can't um, fix my electricity or my plumbing. I mean, if those things- Oh, did you say, on, I didn't hear you clearly. Was it Google? Google. Google, right, okay. Yeah, I, I can't fix my electricity. I can't fix my plumbing. If those go wrong, I call someone. Um, there's something really simple, like how to change a light switch. You know, maybe I'll go on YouTube or something. Yeah. But you know, most people, people now are self-diagnosing, you know, over the internet very often, or they're, you know, in some group or on some blog and they, you know, they've decided which treatment's going to work. Once in a while, they're right, but a lot of the time, they're not. And, and it, sometimes it becomes harder to explain things just because they've um, indoctrinated themselves with a particular mindset of someone they've never met who, you know, might or might not be, you know, expert in what they're saying. And they don't realize, you know, so many of the webinars and other things that the people basically have an underlying objective to sell you a particular item, you yeah. know, and a, a sad item, you know, here's the famous parasite cure because Dr. So-and-so is promoting it on these free webinars that go out to everybody and they don't realize that Dr. So-and-so makes $3 for every bottle they sell of such and such. So it, it becomes harder in some ways. Yeah, I, it, it yes, that's, uh, that's, my mind is just racing with all the things you said, yeah. I um I have another question. Um, well, I'm not. Um, yeah, are you are you open for for business in in Hawaii now or right now paused? Pretty open. I mean, we have a cl I mean, we we have a clinic. I was working. Um, I I've always liked working in my house. Mm -hmm. And we're working in our house now, but with my son here, who also does the same work, opened up a clinic. It's um, we haven't officially announced it, but we are open for business. Cool. Well, for people who are um, who are watching this, who might want to find you, maybe they're in the Hawaii area, or maybe they're like me that you know, if you have a condition that's uh, worth it, maybe fly out and get checked. How would they find you? Um. I'd probably go to my son's website. My website's more for the doctors that I teach and it, it, it won't really be relevant. If they go to Dr. Noah Leibowitz, um, dot com, I think it is. Dr. Noah Leibowitz .com. Awesome. I will there's, there's a slight chance it's Dr. Noah Leibowitz DC .com, but I think it's just Dr. Noah Leibowitz. I will have to double check on that if it has a DC or not. And I'll put that in the, like the little description uh, of this so people can find you or find your son, Noah. Yeah, I mean, once in a great while we'll do um, phone consultations, but I prefer not to. I, pref I um, prefer to refer to doctors that I know, like, like yourself and, and others, because uh -huh. um, it's much, much better to do an in-person visit than to do a, a Skype or something like that. Yeah, and, and if, so if someone like, say, for example, lives in New York, how would they find someone who has some of this training? Is it okay if they email you or is there a website that kind of lists doctors who are, you know, trained in this? How would you recommend someone to find a good doctor in their area? They would, they would, need, they would need to email. Email. So email. I don't you. like to have a printed list because okay. it's always changing and so forth. 
Okay, well, I will, um, I will continue to share your email with people who are wondering, like, is there somebody in the Seattle area for my right. mom? And, and they can reach out to you for that. Right, and we do that all the time. Yeah, I have like a, a million questions that I could keep asking, and then I keep wanting to get more technical and ask technical questions, but I wanted to keep it kind of just a general, who are you? And I wanted to say thanks a ton for your teaching. I know you probably don't have to teach, but the teaching that you did and continue to do helps me, and then that helps other people. So thank you from me and, and my patients for the teaching that you've done over the years. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I do have to teach. I mean, it's not like I have to teach for the money. I have to teach because that's what I'm supposed to do. Part of you. Yes. Yes. I thought maybe I, I'm, I'm, my point was you probably don't have to teach for the money, but you love it. Yes. Yes. Well, we're grateful for it. So I will sign off here with, uh, with just a chat. And uh, thank you so much. I might want to, I might think of like 20 more questions and want to do another one in half a year or something, but thank you very much, Mike. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure.